Welcome to COIQ, a first of its kind video program about health innovators, early adopters, and influencers, and their stories about riding the roller coaster of healthcare innovation. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy, founder of Legacy DNA Marketing Group, and it's time to raise our COIQ. Welcome back, COIQ listeners. On today's show, we have with us Dr. Ashish Atreya, and he is the Chief Innovation Officer for Mount Sinai, the founder of the Sinai App Lab, and the founder, you know what? He has founded so many different businesses, and he's got his hands into so many different things. I'm just going to hand it over to him. Welcome to the show, Dr. Atreya. Go for it. Tell us a little bit about your background and what you do. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. I, I would say I will start by saying that my wife calls me 20% doctor because I, because I practice 20% of my time. Uh, rest of the time, I'm very lucky to spend in innovation. So as a chief innovation officer in medicine at Mount Sinai, um, I, I lead uh, innovation, especially in digital health technologies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been a physician informaticist uh, for the last 20 years. Uh, after my residency, I got informatics training, board certified. Uh, but last six years is completely focused not on core informatics, EHR informatics, but actually building new technologies with data scientists, with app designers, with UX, UI, completely new field, what we call as digital medicine. Mm-hmm. And I think that has really, that has even bigger potential to transform healthcare than what EHRs did, you know, for the last 20 years. Um, so, um, so our apps are now in 15 countries. Uh, we have done projects from cancer care to heart care to GI care. And uh, three years ago, I think bulk of our focus, which is right now is we call it a fit journey. We moved from innovation alone to transformation. Mm. Where How do we put all the different innovation that's happening, all the different startups, all the different apps, but making it much more cohesive and much more structured so a health system can unify that and allow it to be transformed. uh, You know, I I work with a lot of health innovators who are, um, you know, having different amounts of success with penetrating the market. And so kudos to you for having your technology in 15 different countries. (laughs) So, you know, what's the secret? Is it um, is is it the the brand name of Mount Sinai behind you? Um, Is it is it something else? Is it the technology? Help us understand how you've been so successful. Yeah, I think our journey is is continuing. I wouldn't call it it's super successful. It's just, you know, we just enjoy every single day and build technologies. I think everyone says that, but I think the reality is technology is a part of it. Uh, And and it's not just one person, it's a team, right, Mm -hmm. which enables that. And it becomes robust over a period of time. Uh, But but also, I think it's a collaboration. Uh, Because I haven't gone to 16 different countries, right? (laughs) But because of collaborations, uh, the partners are able to take things further. So I think le- learning about what technology can do, building new things which have not been there before, creating a unique value, mm-hmm. and then driving down and finding partners which can extend that value and disseminate the value and transform that value um, is, is kind of the core strategy part which I'm involved with. Mm-hmm. Um, without that, you can't scale things. Um, for, of course, technology has to be scalable, but, but there are many technologies which are scalable which don't get scaled because we don't find meaningful partnerships, collaborations to make these happen. Hmm. Absolutely. Collaboration is definitely key. Um, it, or, or do you find that these partnership alliances um, are coming to you? Or are you going out and seeking the, the best ones that are a fit for what you're looking for? That's a great question. Uh, I think uh, when we started off, it was mostly we looking out to say what's out there, uh, because we want to learn from the wider landscape and see what is missing, mm-hmm. uh, which health systems need to do as well, right? Within the Mount Sana, within our app lab, we don't build anything that's been built before. Uh, we try to build new things, you know, so we want to have a very good external landscape view in that mm-hmm. regard. Uh, as we have grown, um, and I think we have also started seeing people or technologies, actually our startups, reaching out to us directly. Um, and, and they are saying, hey, you're doing this, you have a platform approach at Mount Sinai and multiple other health systems, which you can prescribe apps and you can connect all those apps together. Um, what do you think of this app we are building in this space? And this is pretty novel. Uh, so I think, so that is actually a very exciting part where it creates an efficiency, which was not there before. Mm-hmm. It's inefficient to go out and find the right thing. 
but it's more efficient if people come to you. So I think we we're lucky to have that kind of a, a model evolving in that regard. So do you have um, more success uh, penetrating your innovations within the Mount Sinai hospital system that you work in, or do you have more success commercializing it outside of the system? That's a terrible both question. Are, both are inherent. <laughs> both have their own inherent challenges. That is absolutely true, right? And you know, it's it's very easy to say, "Hey, you're within a health system, and you're building technologies." You're probably every person in that health system patient is using your technology. <laughs> but you know, nothing is farther than truth, mm -hmm. uh, right? So I think what happens is uh, health systems have more challenges adopting technology, which are inherent to how they are structured. Mm -hmm. And that is irrespective of technologies within that health system or coming from outside. Those structural challenges remain. And I'll give a very simple example. And I'm a gastroenterologist, so I talk about shit all the time. <laughs> so if you allow me, I can talk about an example yes. from that. Um, so we, so the platform we built to collate all the technology, unify all this technology, got spinned off into a commercial entity called as RX Health, which is a Mount Sinai spin-off. Mm -hmm. uh, and RX.Health, had built more things on top of the platform and they built how they can stitch different technologies together called RX Stitch. And then one small facility in Arizona reached out to them to say, hey, uh, we have such a big problem with colonoscopy patients because we have one in four colonoscopy patients who are poor bowel prep. And we give them a paper and uh, one in four people forget the paper where they've kept. And <laughs> one in by the RX Health worked with them to create an engine completely like a bot engine for periprocedural pericolonoscopy. That became super hit when they measured, they were able to reduce the aborted procedures by half. 92% patients wanted to you know, use it for uh, uh, next procedures. That American Gastroenterology Association, our national association actually now partnered with the RX Health to make it nationally available. Wow. As a best practice. Mm -hmm. Now Mount Sana is now coming up and saying, this is a cool thing, we need to do that. Uh, and now we're bringing it to Mount Sinai. So sometimes I think you bring it externally uh, and you know, and also as a spin-off entity, they can grow much more faster than we can grow internally, right? But they are able to find use cases and sometimes we learn from them and bring back those use cases. Sure. So just an example how it can come, how, how the fusion of innovation can spread, not only inside out, but outside in. So, so there are so many, um, health innovators that are out there right now in the trenches with just incredible innovations that solve, you know, challenges that are like our most pressing issues. And they're overall, I hear that they're really struggling to kind of get in front of the key decision makers and um, to be able to even have a chance to pitch their, their innovation. Um, and even when they do get in, you know, the inherent challenges and barriers to the, to the structure, do you have any, recommendations for our audience, um, some best practices, some strategies for having success with being able to sell to a hospital system? Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a famous saying um, out there, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you know, mm -hmm. go together. Uh, so I think I've seen many startups who struggle uh, with getting key ecosystem, you know, kind of partners and the key thinkers for decision maker um, are just solo scientists. They may mm -hmm. not have a physician in the team. They may not have any care person. So they are completely have an outside lens. Um, but I think my, my, my main recommendations to them is get some, you know, thought leaders, get some patients also, mm -hmm. get the patients, get physicians, get researchers, as advisors, as consultants, as whatever you can, create a role for medical role. Uh, that way you have a knowledge because it's not about, they can't get into a decision maker. It's very tough to know who the decision maker is. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And then someone who partners with them, who is part of the health system can say, hey, what you're building is actually more for quality. And this is inpatient quality. So chief medical officer will be the right person. You don't need to go to CIO for that. Or right. CEO for sure, you don't need to go to CEO <laughs> for that. And never a CFO for that. Right. Sure. So, right. And then this thing which you are building is actually for population health. You need to find who is managing uh, the population health in this place. Right. So I think, so if you get into the front of the right person, then it's much more likely things will either be yes or no. 
but mm-hmm. the decision making will be faster. Uh, but a lot of the time, the challenge is we, we touch someone at the periphery and that person takes its own sweet time, then introduce to some other person and you kind of have this game that's getting played. Um, and, uh, and not because of anyone is insincere, uh, it's just that it's incredibly complex to navigate. Sure. But if you have a person who has navigated a path before, it just makes it much more easier. Yeah, it's interesting. So, you know, when you think about selling, there's all of these different types of decision makers, right? The gatekeeper, the decision maker, the influencer. And I, I, I recommend that clients find their Trojan horse. And so this is someone that's in the organization that has no influence. Um, they're not the gatekeeper. They're definitely not the decision maker, but they are the ones that know everything that's going on, right? They're the ones that can pick up the phone and call you and tell you your competitor just walked in. <laughs> you need to get back in here. <laughs> so I, I think everybody needs to have a Trojan horse too. <laughs> you know, that's a great idea. You know, I've never thought of that, uh, but I can see that can potentially work. You need you need people who vouch for you, advocate for you, who believe mm-hmm. in you. Sure. Um, you know whether it's Trojan horse or not, they may just do it in a good spirit because they really trust you and the value. Right. Yeah. Um, and have taken time to do that because many time decision makers don't even have time mm-hmm. to to find the trust. Uh, sure. But but I think uh, that uh, someone who trusts and believes in you is is super important. So um, what, what innovations, and maybe it's uh, the RX Health, but what innovations have you successfully commercialized um, outside of Mount Sinai? Mm-hmm. So my, my journey started in Cleveland Clinic. Um, so where uh, my first thing, which, I, which was actually, uh, most of what I do is actually based on problem-centric approach. Mm-hmm. What is the problem that's happening rather than solution-centric? what we can build. Yep. So I got a page uh, from higher up in Cleveland Clinic, but I never received that page. This is 2005, 2006, because I was 100 miles, 200 miles away from Cleveland. So then I realized that pages are you know, not at all foolproof, like the, the batteries go die and you lose the pager message. So we created the first web-based paging system mm. uh, at Cleveland Clinic. We will archive all the pager messages. You can automatically forward to someone as if you're going outside. That became so super successful. It's still actually used across the internet health system no by kidding. the name of my paging. Yeah, it's just phenomenal. Um, That's awesome. I it was nice when I went there for grand runs and I saw that being used. So this is like way back technology, but this was one of the first ones. Uh, and that got licensed out to American Messaging, uh, the second biggest pager company in the US. Uh, so I had some experience before I came to Sanai. Um, and at Sanai, I think, when, when we build this platform to prescribe apps connected with EMR, um, uh, we started getting so much requests from other health systems and other peers as well. Um, and within Sinai, we couldn't support other health systems. We don't have team big enough to actually go and support and do integration and all those. Sure. So, so it was very natural. Our Mount Sinai Innovation Partners, our tech transfer team helped create a spin-off um, uh, called as rx.health. So we licensed this platform to prescribe apps and digital care pathways. Mm-hmm. Uh, at that time, this is around two years ago. Yeah. But we also licensed out technology for remote monitoring. Um, uh, so for so patients can keep track how they are doing. And that was plugged on top of the platform as well. Mm-hmm. Um, since then, RX Health has built so much things on top of it. They built a stitch engine where they can connect digital rules together. And they have a whole clinical team, which is making clinical rules around every perioperative care around radiology, and they have partnership with American College of Cardiology to create a cardiovascular toolkit and with AGA for GI toolkit. And one of the key things they are finding is there's so much need for information before and after procedures. Um, And those are very expensive procedures. Uh, So for example, radiology alone, uh, there's a 10% no-show rate for average radiology procedure. Uh, Colonoscopy, one in four patients, you know, sometimes have poor ball prep. So if we provide them information at the right time, it doesn't have to be downloaded app. It could be a bot. Mm-hmm. It could be a, you know, a voice uh, kind of a thing, uh, voice rules. Uh, but if you get them through that journey with a need-based journey, you can suddenly make the whole healthcare much more efficient. Mm-hmm. And it can lead to immediate ROI within the same three months period. So I think part of our uh, learning has been we are able to find not just where routinely you can create uh, ROI for a hospital, which everyone can, 
uh, complex disease and pop health. Sure. But actually, things which are so mundane, people don't even think you can create value. Uh, <laughs> but, but then you look at 100 use cases you can create. It's just healthcare is such an interesting field where if you just are bent upon creating efficiency, you will find 1,000 ways to create efficiency. And, and even CFO would never have thought of that. That is <laughs> so, so we talk a lot about messaging um, with clients in, you know, on the show and, you know, everybody kind of has a different perspective. You know, some folks are like, you've got to have the ROI story. Folk, some other folks are like, you know, there's a, there's a real problem and it's a little bit more of the altruistic, um, you know, goals of like patient care. And then you've got efficiencies and your experience, is it, you know, what's, what's really important? important for the messaging strategy? Is it all of those? Is it one in particular? Yeah. So I think the reality is health systems are really starved of finances. Mm -hmm. uh, the margin has really decreased. Yeah. Uh, if you walk in and share just patient experience of such clinical journey without tangible financial success story, mm -hmm. uh, it's tough to find someone who will just bet on that. Yep. People want that but they wouldn't be able to create resource for that. Mm -hmm. So ultimately it cannot go very far. So a lot of stuff we do is we, we bucket into clinical success and financial success. In mm -hmm. some cases, operational success. And for us, it's not either or. Yep. It's where we can hit all the three bubbles up on the top of the barrel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So you and I have already talked a little bit in the past about this notion of, you know, clinical evidence that the health innovators, uh, you know, have to have in order to have any chance of commercialization. And I know that you've done quite a bit of work in this space. So just kind of talk about um, what what that journey was like for you and in, in creating, um, you know, resources to kind of help innovators develop the evidence that they need. Right. So I think one of the things it's time intensive, right? Something that startups don't necessarily love. Yeah. Uh, but I think healthcare startups are and need to be different than, you know, fintech or other startups, right? Uh, we are touching human lives and there can be potential unintended consequences, either by omission or by commission, right? So, so there needs to be additional layer, level of trust. So it's, it's worthwhile to go through additional year or two to create that evidence. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, the technology we spin off, uh, the remote monitoring platform called Health Promise, uh, it was NIH sponsored trial, two years randomized controlled trial. We showed the value in that and then it got spin off. The same with the platform, we were able to show, we were able to increase activation of the patients from 6%. If you just tell a person to download an app, just in conversation, like you and I. But if I'm a physician, I prescribe you an app that lands on your phone, we were able to increase activation to 92%. With a system usability of 94% percentile, right? So that so, is huge. I mean, mm -hmm. that is just really huge because, you know, I forget what the last count is, but it's like somewhere around 50, 100,000 healthcare apps on the market. And most of them are like crickets and cobwebs, right? There's mm -hmm. nothing going on in there. And that doesn't mean that it wasn't a viable tool. Um, so not only do you have to sell the innovation, but then once it's sold, you've kind of got to have this strategy for adoption. So, so yeah, just speak to that a little bit more. I think sure. that's huge. So, yeah, so we, we hit a kind of a roadblock three years ago because a lot of the stuff we were doing were building apps and that was fairly successful in research setting. And they were successful because the research coordinator was able to walk the patient, you know, kind of handhold the patient. But, but if you really want a scalable transformation, you cannot have a research coordinator or any kind of Right, right. That's not time efficient, right? So, so, so then we did a time motion analysis and we saw patients, if we recommend them an app in the routine conversation like you and I, patients will forget the name. They will mm -hmm. mistype the name. Even if they get the right name, there are more than 350,000 apps. So they forget the activation code and which is the right app. Sure. So, so we knew there were actual customer friction factors for them to get into the app. And here we were building all these assets and apps and apps, uh, and, but no one is using them because there was no platform to deliver it to the right patients. So that led to our one or two years effort just completely building a platform to deliver apps to patients. Initially, we started out delivering one-to-one, -one, like patient comes to us in a clinic, we prescribe an app, they get onboarded, we found 92% engagement rate with very high usability. 
Wow. When we spin off to rx.health, they built a platform for bulk prescribing where they can prescribe to thousands of patients at once. And they did that for Yale New Haven, where they were able to prescribe 25,000 people my chart app and got, you know, 10 to 15% patients converted into my chart. Uh, wow. And that led to what eight people would have taken a year to do, were able to do in two days using this capability. Uh, now you're using API and Firebase engine, we can actually auto prescribe apps where if the, the patient new code of asthma gets dropped and there's an asthma app, it automatically gets dropped, prescribed to the patient without a human touch. So I think a lot of the journey has been making it so easy to reduce any burden on the physicians because mm-hmm. EHR have already created enough burden. Our goal is with digital medicine to create it in such a way that it is, it is in a way invisible. The magic happens behind the scene. The patients get engaged. The patients come at the appointment, but physicians don't even have to click on anything and they get the benefit. Mm-hmm. I think we as a, as a provider community, as a care community deserves a technology which actually works for us. That sure. Sense. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So, you know, how has pharma responded to this idea of prescribing apps? So uh, it has been actually a very, we have a lot of collaborations with pharma now. Mm-hmm. Um, internally at Sana Apple, but Rx Health also, they made the announcement uh, that they have a partnership now with five years uh, with Roche. Um, around um, IBD to create a national network of 10,000 patients mm-hmm. will be on the app and the data will come back, right? Wonderful. Connecting with IBD centers. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Roche wants to take it to Europe and many other countries as well. So I think pharma is looking for solutions to meaningfully engage the patients. They're not very different than health systems. Mm-hmm. Uh, even payers want to meaningfully engage with the patients. Sure. Uh, right, they all come with a slightly different perspective. But if you have a platform approach, it's the same thing which pharma wants to do, a certain set of things which health systems wants to do, mm-hmm. right? So you find common grounds and, and, and pharma can sometimes fund those endeavors which health systems may not have bandwidth to fund. Yep, absolutely. So how does, so is, you know, is it open source um, or open innovation where if, um, you know, somebody has an app, they, uh, uh, you know, for a patient, you know, how do they get access to the RX platform so that way their app can be prescribed? Yeah. So I think uh, it's a curation platform between RX.health. So first, anyone who's an app vendor can actually just say, hey, we're building this. And there's a very simple online process, onboarding process, where they just have to show, is it evidence-based or not? Okay. Right. And mm-hmm. so, so there's a curation process. So many apps get blocked if they're not of high quality they do not have the right clinical content or they do not have the right API for interfaces, right? But if there's the right technologies, whether it's an app, whether it is a shared decision-making video, uh, whether it is a variable device or, you know, um, uh, internet of things, any of those things, as far as it's validated and it's a, it's a value-driven thing, uh, it's an open API which RX Health has and that will open it so it can be prescribed. Okay. So it becomes when- a marketplace in that regard. Yeah. So you touched on, um, you know, this innovation that you were developing in 2005, and now it's 2019. So you've kind of been at this for a while. And if you think about, you know, where the industry was in 2005, and then where we are today, man, we, you know, a lot of people, you know, there's still a lot of change that needs to take place. But in, in some regards, we've come a long way. Um, so what are the challenges that you think that health innovators are still facing today or that are facing in 2019? A lot of challenges, I think still, I think the the biggest asset has been technology, right? So what our programming team used to take nine months to build an app. Now we can build that within a week, Hmm. right? It's just been amazing from a data science perspective. All the algorithms had to be written yourself for neural networks. And now those are all packaged stuff and you can just run those models, right? So yeah. I think that efficiency has, has been created. Um, I think efficiency has not been created in adoption in health systems, mm-hmm. right? So those process challenges, those people challenges actually remain. And in fact, they may be worse now uh, because there's so much technology now that we may be creating barriers of adoption because which horse to bet on uh, becomes a problem for the, for sure. the health systems as well. Um, I, I think 
also i think because technology has become i would say a little bit a commodity uh it is easier to build things but it is tougher to distinguish and create something novel mm right so so people say hey this is great this is fascinating uh but not many novel things come mm-hmm. which are value driven as well so i think part of still the challenge is to create novel things not just what is the platforms which are built on top of that but truly unique solutions and truly which can be game changers uh, mm-hmm. even if it's a narrow vertical yep absolutely um so w- what do you think is the biggest driver of success what is it, you know if you had one lesson that you've learned in this whole process kind of speaking directly to our audience who are in the trenches right now um you know what are what are some lessons or at least one thing that you would recommend to them i think it's believing in yourself and your team and having resilience it it does come to core human principles right the barriers will always be there they've been there anything that mankind has done right any scientist does anything for researchers for clinicians right for it's the same for innovators as well but but truly if you believe you want to create value right and and you believe the path is the right like you're on the right track mm-hmm. just having resilience uh, allows you to take all those barriers all those challenges in in a in a very neutral manner uh because everything is positive if you are in the right direction the barriers will just change the speed of how fast you can run mhm but the direction you decide right yeah. and if the direction is right then you're gonna reach there where you want to be and i think that that's you know so it's i think i've learned a lot it's it's you know as a physician we do things we nearly always have success right so i see patients they get better if they don't get better we always know why they didn't get better right mm-hmm. in a startup or innovation it's not like that right things are never done before so you don't even know you're on the right path or not so so you can't just based on external te- external things always you're right or wrong you have to have internal parameter as well uh, and your team you know which which becomes your multiplier factor in that as well mhm yeah Absolutely. Well, this has been a very valuable conversation. I thank you so much for the wisdom that you've shared with our audience. I know that they have learned a lot from you today. And um so as we wrap up here, what is the best way for people to get a hold of you if they have some questions for you and they want to just kind of follow what you're doing? Sure. Uh I think Twitter is easy at atreja, A T R E J A. Uh is a very easy way to get hold of me. um they can also get hold of me through uh, app lab there is a contact so if you just go to applab.nyc um they'll be able to get a contact form and get hold of me or linkedin uh i'm the one wearing a bow tie they can find me um and just connect with me uh, love the branding of the bow tie <laughs> <laughs> brilliant <laughs> all right well thank you so much wonderful thank you so much it's a pleasure What's the difference between launching and commercializing a healthcare innovation? Many people will launch a new product, few will commercialize it. To learn the difference between launch and commercialization and to watch past episodes of the show, head to our video show page at drroxy.com. Thanks so much for watching and listening to the show. You can subscribe to the latest episodes on your favorite podcast app like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. or subscribe to the video episodes on our YouTube channel. No matter the platform, just search COIQ with Dr. Roxy. Until next time, let's raise our COIQ.